start off by picking up where, where Mindy left off, and uh, I think she had a tremendous point that there was uncivil discourse all the time, long before any of these platforms existed. You know, we had Willie Horton ads long before, uh, before Twitter or Facebook. And I think back to an exchange during a heated point in the 1980 Republican primary, one of the debates, uh, and, I, and Ronald Reagan took the mic and said, excuse me, sir, I paid for this microphone. And I think the difference with social media is no one has to pay for the microphone that there's now a democratization of access to the discourse that has meant that more people have gotten involved in it and more voices, and so it's probably a greater reflection of the overall political discourse as opposed to just the people who paid for the microphones um, afraid to cross that line, whatever the line is. Um, as I work with members of Congress, with, with agencies, with candidates, I think one of the first points that I always cover with them is that people come to Twitter for a reason. It's to instantly connect to information that is meaningful to them and to do it in real time. And for that information to be meaningful, they want it to be credible, they want it to be useful. And so the overall Twitter population is invested in having a meaningful, credible conversation. Now that doesn't mean that every single individual is, but it does mean that in many cases you have a self-correcting mechanism. Bad speech can be drowned out by good speech. Uh, incorrect facts can be drowned out by correct facts. There's always talk whenever there's another RIP fill-in celebrity name here meme going around about, oh, Twitter killed another celebrity. But when you look at the search results, you see that the correction that they're still alive usually spreads more quickly than the story that they were dead. You definitely saw that when that initial NPR report of Gabriel Giffords having been killed whipped around. And 15 minutes before any of the cable networks pulled back that story, the Twitter search for the name was full of the correction saying, no, she's alive, she's, she's in search. Um, I also think that there is an efficiency to the dialogue, particularly on Twitter, but also on social media platforms, other social media platforms, in that you know, I, I spent five years working on Capitol Hill, and I did my share of staffing a center for town halls and reading constituent mail, and one of the tough things would be that sometimes you would get this five-page screed of a letter, <laughs> you know, that definitely goes anti the concept of civility. And somewhere in there, they actually, 99% of the time, had a valid point. But it got lost in the tone of the overall letter. In 140 characters, you can glance at a tweet and know if they're adding something sub substantive to the conversation or not. And if they're not, you can move on. Users, we talk to them, when they see a celebrity or a member of Congress getting 1,000 app replies a day, they're not expecting the member of Congress to respond to each and every single one, they recognize they have a job to do that's bigger than just tweeting all day. And so what I counsel members of Congress to do and candidates to do is to find those representative voices that are adding to the conversations uh, uh, some substance and credibility and asking in a civil way. And in that way they can answer the question of the entire community and in so doing almost training the community a bit that, hey, you ask in a civil, productive way, I'll engage with you. If you don't, I won't. And the community learns to adapt very quickly. 